Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Doorstep Podcast. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vosdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie Council. Excited in a moment to bring back um, Professor David Yermak from NYU Stern to speak with us about all of the big crypto NFT news coming out of Russia, Ukraine, and what it means for us here at the doorstep. Um, but before that, Nick, today is the one month anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, it's a big moment. Um, President Zelensky of Ukraine spoke uh, to NATO leaders today who are meeting with President Biden. He flew over. Um, what are you hearing coming out of those meetings? If anything, um, what are you expecting to happen? Um, is there gonna be a huge shift now that we're moving into the second month of war? Well, I think from the perspective that we look at, the doorstep perspective, what is fascinating about this meeting is the sense of the doorstep issues that are lurking uh, in the question of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what the NATO and allied response uh, ought to be. Uh, most uh, analysts had uh, assessed that uh, a Russian invasion would be swift, uh, there'd be changes on the ground within days, uh, and we'd all be presented with some sort of fait accompli. Instead, what we've seen uh, is Ukraine has shown uh, that uh, a middle country can hold off what technically is a great power. Uh, we may have some doubts about how good or, or effective uh, the Russian military and, and government and economy have been. But this has also raised the question of, is there as compelling a need for Western intervention? And with the doorstep is interesting is you have very, uh, divergent views. One is, is that because of some of the trends we're going to be talking about later with David, uh, people's ability to be connected to this war, to this invasion, uh, even more than the Gulf War or the Iraq War, uh, that people can be uh, geolocating events, they are in touch with family and friends, they are getting real-time information, is, has led to people wanting to do more. Uh, on the other hand, there's also concern about uh, getting involved and then the costs and the risks. And so what the leaders are doing is fascinating, is they want to send a signal that Ukraine is being helped, all of the uh, weaponry, the aid, uh, assistance that is going through, but also uh, managing domestic constituencies uh, that want to do more with those that want to do less. And also the other doorstep issues that are coming up uh, as political leaders deal with rising prices for food, for energy, uh, as they deal with questions about supply chains. Uh, we really are, uh, I think, on the cusp of moving forward with what some of our earlier guests have talked about, uh, notably Ash Jane, about are you going to see democracies much more willing to trade with each other, do business with each other, even if there's a higher upfront cost because of the sense that uh, in the long run, you can't rely on autocratic nations for uh, key goods and services. And will this lead to kind of more domestic spending? Uh, finally, the last thing that's fascinating is uh, and to hear this at the at the NATO meeting and the EU meeting that will be taking place is all of this move to rapidly move us towards a green transition and that we have to do more and we have to do it more quickly. And I'm sure that there are climate activists that are on the one hand gratified, but on the other hand, scratching their head that uh, it wasn't Greta Thunberg, Thunberg that was able to do this, it was Vladimir Putin. <laughs> that has really given the green energy uh, agenda uh, a massive shot in the arm. And so we may see the emergence of an odd marriage of geopolitics uh, with climate activists uh, to really uh, move us forward uh, on, the, uh, on the green agenda. And so to have those be at, at, as part of the agenda, less on the NATO side, more on the EU with the United States and Japan in those talks. Uh, moving forward. So 
what is, is interesting is to see how political leaders very much have a sense that uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has doorstep implications from the fact that people are getting unfiltered information to the fact that they are carefully monitoring what people are paying uh, for uh, what they're buying in the stores and at the gas stations. Yeah, I think this is happening um, at a particular moment where communications are so prevalent and so important. Every, you know, it's not only that everybody feels they have an opinion, it's that everybody has access to different um, uh, points of, of entry into a story. Um, so whether you're looking at it from the climate angle or the ch child refugee angle, or there's so much information that you could find out there, um, I, you know, which is fascinating. We speak about this with um, David in a second, um, but I think it's really empowered people, as you mentioned, Nick, to feel like they can have an opinion, say something, speak up, which many, for example, celebrities are doing. Um, I'm moving along to, we have, uh, we're in a lot of award season, a lot of celebrities are speaking up, they're hearing from their fan base about Ukraine, they're talking a lot about Ukraine. Um, we have the Oscars coming up, I will be so interested to see how much is said on that front, because that's a, that's a big platform, gets a lot of attention. Um, and we've spoken about it, um, and I want to give a little plug to our book talk, which we did last week um, with Eric Schwartzel. Red Carpet, Hollywood, China, and the Global Battle for Cultural Supremacy. Um, I think we raised some important issues about communications, um, censorship, um, and, and Hollywood. Uh, and so ahead of the Oscars, for those of you um, who want to have a listen, um, so maybe give some context to what is going on um, and how we are linked here at the doorstep uh, to the world, not only to the war, but to China, uh, which also is playing a part in this war. Um, and now I'm so excited to speak to David. Thank you so much for joining us, David. It is so nice to see you, um, especially as I know you just came off a plane or in Frankfurt. We will hear about that later, I'm sure. Um, but it's been less than a year since we've spoken with you, but it feels like advances in crypto, in NFTs, uh, in everything, um, ethereal <laughs> have taken off over the past year, especially over the past month, I would say. Uh, a headline from USA Today announced this is our first crypto war. Um, research from the Pew Center says more and more Americans have at least heard of crypto than when we spoke in June last year. Um, I'm not sure where we are though. You know, our you know, what are the true real advances? You walked us through it last year and we're hoping you could take us through what's really going on, what's real, what's just a headline. Uh, to, so our listeners, our audience can really understand the impact at the doorstep. Um, and, and I guess, could we start with that first headline? Is this the first crypto war? Is that a true headline? What are I think that's, thoughts? you know, maybe an exaggeration. There, there are crypto stories on both sides of the, the Russian Ukraine war. And on the Ukrainian side, the government is using the Bitcoin blockchain and several other blockchains to crowdsource donations from people around the world who have sent in, last estimate I saw is about $130 million worth of crypto. And they're being careful not to spend it on weapons, but on things like protective flak jackets and medicine and you know, relief for displaced people, you know, all, all sorts of humanitarian reasons that people are probably very comfortable donating to. On the Russian side, it's not nearly as well documented, but there's a lot of concern that the people under sanctions are using crypto to get capital out of Russia or out of wherever they have it parked and are trying to hide it in crypto. I'm not sure that's going to work out because crypto is very traceable. In fact, it might be a big mistake for one of these oligarchs to you know, go on the Bitcoin blockchain. But there has been um, a lot of concern about this. There were hearings in the US Senate. I think Elizabeth Warren was trying to make some points about how this needs to be shut down because it enables capital flight by bad people. Um, I think we'll probably learn more about this, but definitely there are people trying to opt out of the Russian financial system any way that they can. And this is one possible route of escape for them. Can you uh, 
maybe discuss that a bit more because some of the big boosters of crypto all the way to the start of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine were saying crypto allows you to escape national governments. It allows you to safeguard your wealth. You'll be able to, to move invisibly, seamlessly through the, through the global economic system. Um, why isn't that playing out? Uh, wh why, why doesn't, once I turn everything into Bitcoin or Dogecoin, the, the notion that I've now escaped national jurisdiction and the Americans, or even international for that matter, the Americans can't touch me. Um, when, when that was such uh, the, the selling point, I would say, of at least some people towards crypto, that this was the currency that liberated you from, from government control. Can you explain a bit more about maybe why that, why simply holding uh, your, your funds in crypto doesn't automatically uh, mean you've magically escaped government regulation? So the relevant problem for people right now in Russia is that the SWIFT network, which is really the conduit for most cross-border transactions, they, they've essentially been kicked off of the SWIFT network, which is a very serious problem for anyone trying to move money in or into or out of the country. Now, there's no real way to exclude people from the Bitcoin blockchain or the Monero blockchain or any number of others. They're just um, decentralized networks that run all over the world, anywhere that there is an internet connection. And it is correct that it is seamless and it's very rapid. You can really instantly move money around the world much faster than you could on the SWIFT network. But it's also extremely transparent that you can actually see the funds go from one wallet to another. Now, the wallets are not labeled like Mr. Oligarch. You don't, you just see bits and bytes, but with a very minor amount of detective work, you can usually identify who is behind the wallet. And in fact, it may backfire on them by bringing much more transparency into the scale of their wealth and where they've kept it. Because you do have to move the assets onto and off of the Bitcoin blockchain and those points of entry and exit are really where governments are going to pounce. So, you know, when we talk about this in class, you tell the students never buy drugs on a blockchain, you know, because you leave a record for the government, you know, always pay cash because cash really can't be traced. And I think you could just give the same advice to a Russian oligarch, never try to launder money on a blockchain because they'll be able to find you. The other problem is also one of scale. The um, the Bitcoin blockchain just doesn't accommodate that much traffic that could really enable someone to move billions of dollars illicitly. Maybe tens of millions if you did it in small chunks over a period of days. But you, know, you would, again, leave a lot of footprints and it would be very hard work to get all that done. It's not really a realistic alternative if you have a billion dollar problem. I think for smaller fish, people kind of at the margins, you know, people who maybe met Putin once and are just trying to, you know, scurry out of the country, this might be useful. But, you know, for the Abramoviches and, you know, Boris Berezovskis of the world and so forth, no. But what's interesting to your point about small scale, um, you know, and, and regular Russians, entrepreneurs, right? Because there's a, there's a huge amount of, of middle class, right? That, that might want to leave the country or might be stuck outside of the country. So I was doing some reporting, for example, in Indonesia, you have a lot of Russians stuck there and what the way they're trying to get at their money is using crypto, which I don't think yeah. we foresaw when we talked last year. So can we talk about like the use by the mainstream retail and um, you know, not even investor, right? Because they're just trying to get their money back. Um, you know, we yeah. talked a lot about last year that it can't be a currency, but people are really trying to use it to get currency. We've actually seen this for years in Iran, where there are small businessmen, you know, rug merchants who want to import and export their products. Iran has been cut off of the SWIFT network, you know, for decades. But if you're just a small businessman or, you know, member of the middle class, not part of the political establishment, maybe we don't want the sanctions to impact you. you know, and we've had a lot of discussion about Russia. Is it just Putin who we're trying to crush or is it all the 
working families, you know, all the business people who are probably not a supporter of any of what's going on. And with crypto, you can really, um, on a small scale, use this as an alternative. In fact, it's probably simpler for many of these folks than using the SWIFT network, even if it were enabled and legal because it's quicker and cheaper. Yeah. And you, you know, you have an interesting market there that has both, uh, you know, political arguments on both sides of whether you would wish this to, to be allowed. But I think these are not people that governments will take the time to track down. They're just, you know, a very small fish in a bigger pond. They're, they're more interested in the political leadership, the billionaires who are behind the big defense companies and so forth. But on this scale, though, um, and you mentioned Elizabeth Warren, and I know President Biden also mentioned, we got to look at this asset class, we got to regulate it more. One of the things we talked about last year was that there is no regulation, people have been slow and not on board. Yeah. What's happened in the last year? Has much happened? Is there a lot of movement? There's a lot of talk, but not much movement. And you have third parties who are intermediaries. So I think most members of the public, if you want to invest in crypto, you open an account at a place like Coinbase or Binance that in fact will be regulated under our money transmission laws and so forth. So if you involve a third party intermediary, and I think most people will do that for the convenience, then you have pretty traditional regulation that is taking form around those entities. But if you simply want to open a wallet on the blockchain, and it's as simple as having an app on your cell phone, if you're reasonably comfortable with the technology, um, mm -hmm. there's no real way to regulate you. Um, you really have to rely on voluntary compliance. You know, the, the IRS has said, if you make money on crypto, you have to pay taxes. But for them to get the list of the people who have actually done that, would be very, very difficult. It'd probably exceed the value of the taxes due. And in theory, anyone moving money across borders has to comply with you know your customer, you know, all kinds of thin send regulations to make sure that you're not sending money to terrorists. But again, for FinCEN, which is the financial crimes enforcement now, that, that's part of the Treasury Department, um, they just don't have a third party they can rely on to centralize and arrange the data for their convenience and they they don't have the resources in the government and probably never will to do this one one person at a time so it's you know it's really the decentralization the lack of any third party entity like a broker or a bank who has everybody in a list of accounts and tracks all their activities if you're just a bunch of free agents with wallets sending money to each other very very difficult for the government to to catch up with these people any That's one really... person that they're looking for, they can probably find them. But look at 10 million people and say, which of these people owe tax you know, to the U.S. government for capital gain? You know, impossibly complicated. That's fascinating what you're painting as a picture here, because the traditional understanding of financial safe havens, and we're seeing this with, with Switzerland now, uh, uh, certainly, is that you had to be a big player. Uh, and what you're saying here in some ways is this democratizes <laughs> uh, the ability to, to move money and, and to do some concealment. And in fact, being a smaller fish is probably better. Uh, Much easier it, for a smaller person, yeah. Which, which is and a I don't think you can rely question. on Switzerland yeah. anymore either. I mean, that's clear that the Swiss have crossed over. You know, they've, they shut off the Russians just like everybody else. And the Russians are furious about this. Right, that that national jurisdictions, but again, as you said, that moving a billion dollars is going to be difficult and, and a lot of attention. But smaller groups, smaller individuals may, in fact, that that crypto, in fact, may be the the financial tool of the of the small investor, the small player, uh, for for being able to take advantage of these uh, these uh, features rather than the, than the big players. And um, you know, does that speak? You know, what does that speak for the future? I mean, we've talked about the, the Russia and Ukraine in the context of the invasion and, and, and you know, the tourists in Indonesia and elsewhere. But what does this do for, for people uh, around the world that live in jurisdictions, either where currencies aren't necessarily stable or uh, where they, people may want to have stash money in order to be able to get out um, 
I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, starting in places like Hong Kong, uh, but but elsewhere, is there is there a future where crypto uh, becomes the safety valve for the middle class for the world's middle classes? Uh, or yeah, again, do you think this. governments will start to regulate this? There there are states like Venezuela that you can point to where the currency has gone into free fall and people have almost reverted to barter, you know, commodities like flour taking the place of the national currency. But you do see heavy concentrations of Bitcoin use in those areas where people are using it for precisely the reasons that you said, you know, and if I'm a Russian, let's say you're an architect with 20,000 rubles in your bank account, I think taking those 20,000 rubles, buying Bitcoin is one of the smarter things that you could do and then head for the airport with a one-way ticket and then you can get those Bitcoin wherever you land. Um, they'll be available to you as long as you can connect to the internet. Yeah. I think what governments really need to be concerned about is if this technology ever scales up. Um, right now, Bitcoin does four transactions per second worldwide which is just not very many, but it is something that can be improved upon. And in fact, many of the other coins that are out there have taken the design of Bitcoin and made it more efficient, more robust and so forth. I think Bitcoin still enjoys a first mover advantage, but I think progress is inevitable that this will scale up and it will eventually become a big problem for governments. I think they may need to reconsider not only the approach to financial regulation, but whether it's even worth their time or, or is, you know, is this simply a human right to move money around the world without surveillance and taxation? And I think the people who started the Bitcoin project and some of the predecessors to it, they were libertarians who you know, really saw this as something that the government shouldn't be able to, to monitor. It's an invasion of privacy and a restriction on your freedom. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that, that was the motivation of the people who designed this. And the only thing missing is the scalability. The technology is extremely clever, but at the moment it's, it's still very small. It, it can't handle trillions or even billions of dollars that typically move every day through the regular financial system. But 10, 20 years from now, I, I wouldn't make any assumptions that that isn't going to be possible. Yeah, I mean, because last year we said, well, El Salvador, it's an aberration or we'll see what happens there. And then this year we have Eric Adams, our new mayor here in New York City, being paid his first check in crypto. And all of a sudden everybody's talking about it. Um, I don't know that everybody understands it, but everybody, it, it's more a, an acceptable piece of the conversation. Yeah, I think, you know, the Eric Adams thing, and I would put it right next to the mayor of Miami, Florida, who did something very similar. Those shouldn't be seen as anything other than publicity stunts that are trying to attract businesses to the city, you know, to give an aura of crypto friendliness. Um, what I said about Eric Adams, though, and I was interviewed God knows how many times, I said, if he wants to take his paycheck and invest it in Bitcoin, you know, whatever, that's his business but it has no real significance for the city. The regulation of currency is typically at the national level and to a certain extent at the state level, but municipal governments one way or another, you know, don't have much to do with this, but it definitely, you know, it generated an immense amount of news coverage. I'm not sure it really resulted in any change in the footprint of the technology in New York, because we already did have this Silicon Alley neighborhood, you know, pretty vibrant crypto community already in the city. But I do think Miami has perhaps um, established itself some, as somewhat of a tech hub. And, you know, if you believe what you read in the paper, everyone's moving to Miami and leaving Silicon Valley. And, you know, there may be other reasons like inheritance taxes that play into that as well. But um, it's been kind of fun to see you know, the, the way that this has migrated into popular culture and how politicians see it as part of their brand that can attract a certain demographic. Um, I think at this point, you know, the need to explain to people what is this, you know, and why, why did anyone invent this, that, that's no longer necessary. People are familiar with it. They see that the, it's sort of a rebellious, edgy, disruptive currency. And um, 
it is something that you know young hipsters are have, have an affinity for and I, you know this doesn't do anything to hurt its popularity i suppose speaking of that um the way i came to this this piece and why i thought we needed to do this now um for so many reasons was a, a friend of mine who owns a gallery sent me her instagram uh link to nft uh you dash crane, um, which was a platform of NFT artists creating these digital um, art, this digital artwork, and then using the proceeds um, to donate to, to Ukraine. Um, and so I thought, wow, you know, is this really, is this really something, you know, and in the process of all of this, you know, I found the crazy people, Christie's $66 million art, NFT artwork being sold, which maybe generated a lot of press in a certain area, but certainly wasn't really widespread. And I thought, my goodness, you know, what is going on with NFTs, mm. and NFT digital art? And then certainly how can this be used for activism? So I know that's three separate questions, but maybe we can start with, yeah, okay, people know Bitcoin, people know NFTs, but what, or, you know, crypto, Bitcoin, but what are NFTs in that? Point? An NFT is an entry in a blockchain that allows you to register a piece of property. And ironically, this goes back to the invention of the blockchain, which predates Bitcoin by about 17 years. The first blockchain was launched in the early 1990s by cryptographers at Bell Labs, and they were interested in registering intellectual property. Mm. So if you make a beautiful digital picture, I can just copy the file and say that I made it. And it can be very hard. This has been a problem in art for hundreds of years, the, the problem of provenance. But a blockchain, because the entries are sequential, if somebody enters before somebody else with a replication of the property that they want to identify, that provides essentially the same thing that the registry of deeds at the courthouse does but in a way that can't be backdated, it's much more robust. And since it's decentralized, there's no politician controlling the access to it and so forth. So NFTs have evolved into a way to register creative property. And some of this is digital art. The people that sold at Christie's for 67 million is the, the outlier, but there have been um, Lots of novelty collectibles like the crypto punks and the bored apes that have become rather prestigious. And some of these have sold for millions of dollars. And there has been a very successful commercialization of the sports industry through series like the NBA Top Shot, where you can get limited edition video clips that you would collect like you might have collected baseball cards or comic books in hard copy form. And this is spreading very quickly, not only in the sports world, but in areas like fashion, where there are limited edition NFTs of accessories like you know, handbags and you know, luxury jewelry and you know, whatever. It is partly, I think, a support platform to market a real product. So if you're a football team with a series of NFTs, it's a way to attract and hold on to your fan base. But in its own right, these things have become very valuable. And if we do begin to live part of our lives in the metaverse, they, they may have even more promise and potential. So, you know, lots of innovation taking place in this space. And the one that's really been very successful is the NBA Top Shot, which has you know, just totally revolutionized the collectible space by bringing digital media into an area that, you know, is just widely in demand by, by sports fans. And I think, you know, allowing a lot of people the opportunity to participate in this space. And, you know, I, I, it does tend to trend younger. Um, I, you know, what I've been hearing from my students, um, you know, trying to get me into it. Um, but, but I find that, you know, especially over the last month, the fact that people have been talking so much about it and its use for activism, which is related to politics and political purposes. Sure. And I think this, this movement away from just, you know, entertainment or owning something to using it to influence, um, do you think that's concerning? Should it be more looked at, more regulated? It's an interesting question. And it almost gets into areas of free speech. You know, you began with the example of Ukrainian artists who are creating limited edition digital art to 
essentially raise money for a charitable cause. And unless there is a scam behind this, and there, there may well be, I would be a little bit careful about this, but I don't think there's a lot of concern. Um, now, when politicians begin selling NFTs of, you know, what if Donald Trump were selling NFTs of his speech on January 6th, you know, limited editions, um, you know, that might get into campaign finance laws that, and there's already a lot of regulation there. Um, you know, what if a Supreme Court nominee sold NFTs of her appellate opinions? You know, and that, you know, all kinds of possibilities are here, some of which may or may not raise ethical questions, but I think the imagination of the promoters is the only real limit to this. And the, um, the nature of media is changing so quickly. And like you said, the, the younger generations really expect a mobile phone app to convey most of you know, what they do in terms of their personal lives. And, and there, there are businesses actively addressing this in the arts in finance and sports and so forth. And the NFT is a point of entry for a lot of these applications. So I hear about this stuff from my kids and it's, um, it's very interesting what people are doing. I think like a lot of collectible fans, though, you know, some of this stuff is going to have a very short half-life. You know, do you think these bored apes will really be selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars five years from now? Um, I'm not convinced of that, but time will tell. One of the things, both in your discussion of crypto and then uh, discussing the non-fungible tokens uh, is it, as you have said, it presumes access to the internet. And right. we've had some issues, obviously, in this country. If we talk about a digital divide. Uh, there's been talk, uh, not only what Russia has done uh, internally, but externally of severing uh, connectivity to, to the larger internet. What is, what is all of this? As you said, more people are living online. More people are living in the metaverse. More people ex you know, expect to have this. What is this? do you think going to do with normalizing the idea that internet access isn't just a privilege or a service, but really is a utility or that everyone should have access for it? Um, you know, what's gonna, is there gonna be a chicken and egg that these crypto drives digital access or that because people want these things, they're going to demand it? Uh, uh, as you said, people expecting to live more of their lives uh, in in this in this realm. Um, yeah, this what, it's become a big infrastructure issue in the United States, and you probably know that the bill that was passed last August had a lot of money for bringing the internet to remote parts of the United States that up until now have not been very well served. And during the pandemic, when we all went to school on Zoom. There were clearly parts of the country where this was difficult for poorer families and in communities where commercial providers had never seen the opportunity to build out the fiber optics. So, you know, just like access to drinking water and electricity, I think access to the information artery of the web has come to be seen in the U.S. as a necessity. And you even see cities, entire cities, just having free Internet as you walk down the street. I know they have this in Philadelphia and so forth. I expect this will be pretty universal. Now, an interesting problem is in the developing world where they simply don't have reliable electrical grids. And I think a lot of the, um, the disappointment perhaps with crypto, it, it was seen as a way to promote financial inclusion to you know people who can't get bank accounts could get Bitcoin wallets and so forth but you need an electrical connection. You need a grid that is going to provide electricity reliably 24 seven. And that's not really the case in Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. So I've actually written a research paper on this and it's, it's very interesting to see which countries have been more successful and have not. And it has a lot to do with the legal system promoting infrastructure investments. The other dimension to this, and it was reflected in your question, is countries where access to the internet is turned on and off for political reasons. And I think the, the standout example of this is known as the Great Firewall of China, where you know, the Chinese very regularly limit who can go online and where you can go and so forth. Um, 
What was interesting in Russia was the downloading of VPN software. A VPN is a virtual personal network that can bypass the typical government sensors. And for whatever reason, either the Russians haven't figured out how to suppress those or they see this as a bridge too far. But you know, the day the war started, there were zillions of downloads of VPNs where people just assumed that the government would begin censoring the web and they wanted to bypass that. Um, even at NYU, we have a campus in Shanghai, which raises a lot of troubling questions about academic freedom, in my opinion. But when I talk to the faculty and the students there, they say, we don't have any problems because we have a VPN. And you know, I say, I'm not going there until I can read the New York Times online. They say, well, you can read it on the VPN. And I mean, for me, that's not good enough. But these workarounds you know, that people use, mm. I think, only highlight the necessity of this, you know, certainly in the business that I'm in doing academic research, if you can't communicate with colleagues around the world, exchange data, get information from primary sources, you can't really do scholarship, whatever field it is that you work on. And I think that in countries that are very authoritarian about access to information, in the long run, it compromises the spread of knowledge, the growth of the economy, all the good things that come from education and learning. And I think, you know, just like access to, to clean water, to sanitation, to transport and so forth, access to information by the internet is an absolutely vital piece of infrastructure. And it's, it's nice to see the US acting on it, but I think it you know, really is something that should be urgent in every country in the world. Well, and what is the role of private business in that? Because we see Elon Musk with his Starlink satellite yeah. I mean, that, that has kind of saved Ukraine and allowed us, speaking of access to information, you know, I have friends who get alerts when there is, um, you know, an air raid in their town, in their town of their families here in the U.S., you know, and then they post it on Facebook and then we all we reply in horror, right? And so this, this, like, as if this was next door, but without this internet connection, that wouldn't exist. Yeah, in fact, I think the best example of this was when the invasion began, it was picked up as traffic by Google Maps, you know, that you could, you could see traffic jams on the Ukrainian roads because the tanks were, you know, people could see in real time how they were moving in a way, you know, that exceeded military intelligence. This is an old debate in infrastructure about whether governments or private companies are better providers. And I think in this country, it probably goes back to the Erie Canal when it was built 200 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do justice to the nuances of this, but you do see people like you know, Elon Musk competing with government providers and often doing the job better. And in the United States, we really do have a tradition of trying to privatize this. And, you know, if you're getting internet, you're probably getting it from Verizon, Fios, you know, or one of the other Comcast, one of the big national communications companies. But other countries have taken different approaches. And I think the answers, you know, are closely intertwined with questions of property rights, tax policy. It's, it's not a simple area. But definitely private capital and private entrepreneurs play an interesting role in this space. And, um, Elon Musk, you know, like others like Richard Branson before him and so forth, have been very clever about bringing services to people that they wouldn't have been able to get through more traditional providers. It's so interesting. And so I'm going to leave off on that note uh, and ask you to come back next year to see where we okay. are, because I don't think we could have predicted where we are today last year. Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad that I began to work in this area because every day you wake up and there are just new things to learn about. It keeps you young intellectually and it keeps students coming to the class. And it's, it's certainly an interesting time, but all the times have been interesting, really. I've been doing this for eight years now. And um, I think, you know, the one thing we didn't mention, but probably should have, is that President Biden put out a big directive about three weeks ago saying that the US needs to start working on a national digital currency, which to me is the, the biggest issue of all. And you know, China's already launched theirs, but I think if you do have me back next year, maybe that will be some, somewhat down the road. It's being worked on by 
people at MIT and the Boston Federal Reserve. And it has um, the potential to really change the way all of us interact with the financial system in the United States. But as usual, we're, we're playing catch up with other countries that are a little bit further ahead with this. All right, you're on. National Digital Currency, next talk yeah. next year. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.